kids start screaming, we're not the bad guy. Right? Yeah. Say no more. If your baby's screaming, you stay seated. The others around you can leave. You know, financially, Carrie and I don't give a lot to this church, but we sure like to know who does. All right, if you join now, you'll know what every person gives in detail. When I'm in the church service, can my car get a bus and a wax? Not just that, but an oil change and a tune-up. Yeah, how about tickets to the Super Bowl? That's asking too much. <laughs> I'm serious. If I'm going to join, I want tickets to the big game. All right. You join now, and we'll get you there. I like a pony. Look in your backyard. Me Church, where it's all about you. Now we can laugh because in humor, there's always a little element of truth. And as we've been studying about I Am a Church Member, what it is to be a biblical church member, what God calls us to in His Word to be a church member, we're we're at this part this week where where His title was, um, let me bring it down on my screen here, I will not let my church be about my preferences or desires. Selfishness has a way of creeping in. Sometimes it's more direct, other times it just kind of comes in slowly. But church that won't be about our preferences. Um, Children can be real selfish, right? Uh, We always see that when we go to Walmart and we see someone's kid yelling and screaming because they didn't get the candy bar or because their mom won't let them open up the ice cream bars and eat them right then and there. That was Autumn, for those of you that don't know. If you bought ice cream at the store and she couldn't get at it right away, she wasn't a happy camper. But, you know, we always see that at Walmart or maybe El Mocajete. I say El Mocajete because last week my boys and I went out to eat. And we went to El Mocajete. And just as we sit down to our amazing chips and salsa, because their chips are the best. As we sat down to eat, some kid decided it was time to have a meltdown. And I mean, and he proceeded to, to go on and on. And his grandmother was there trying to console him. You know, he wanted something that wasn't his. And his grandmother and, and his dad was trying to tell him no, but he would have none of it. You know, the basic no, you can't have it, was met with stomping and more loud noises. And then eventually she kind of hugged him and, and he would flail at her and, and he just wanted his way. And there was no way of stopping him. He wanted it and he wanted it now. And all of us that were sitting around watching, you know, you try not to stare, but you're drawn to that attraction of this kid who's not getting his way, and so he's going to throw a fit. And, and, and in, he didn't care that his grandmother was trying to protect him from stealing or taking something that wasn't here, and that wasn't his. That really didn't matter to him. He wanted it. And eventually his grandmother, you know, wrapped him up in a bear hug and just carried this 8- to 10-year-old boy outside. Now, before I get hate mail... I don't know if the boy was autistic or had a condition or an issue or anything like that. All I know was what I saw and what we experienced as people sitting there in the the restaurant. Now, eight-year-old boys aren't the only ones that when they don't get there in their way in a restaurant, they throw a fit, right? How many adults have you seen who it had pickles on their hamburger and they specifically said no pickles or onion? So right there in the middle of Chili's, they're going to make a scene. I told you I didn't want pickles or onions on my burger. And that poor waitress has to sit there and listen and take that and and take the food back. And how many of you have been there and and you've watched them carry on? I think my meal should be free because it had pickles and onions or it had a hair in it. You know, there was a hair in the fries. Forget the fact that it was your hair that fell out of your head into the fries, you want a free meal, and you want your way, right? Well, when we see it in adults, we cringe even more. Why? Because we expect more out of adults. We expect them to understand that accidents happen, that sometimes a a glitch happens in the computer, or if you're going through the drive-thru, which is where this always happens, right? Because they never get your order right in the drive-thru. Because they know you're not going to turn around. Because you went through the drive-thru because you're in a hurry to begin with, so they just throw anything in that bag and say, here you go, right? But when that meal doesn't come the way we want, as adults, we have a way of, of throwing a fit our way. 
Every order, our order, we want it our way and we want it now. Especially in the great country we live in, we've come accustomed to things coming together our way on our time. And when it doesn't, boy, we have the right to make a scene. Have you ever ordered food and they brought the food and it was the wrong food? And then your kid who was sitting next to you said, Dad, that's what you ordered. Kind of makes you feel bad about complaining to him and demanding you had a free meal, right? I've done that. I ordered something and then it came and I said, this isn't what I ordered. And my kids are going, that is what you ordered, Dad. Mistakes, it happens. Tom writes in his book on page 34. I've got it up here on the screen for you. The strange thing about church membership is that you actually give up your preferences when you join. We talked about this last week, that the church is the only organization founded not for the benefit of its members, but so that their members can serve the community. Let's read on. Don't get me wrong. There may be much about our church that you like a lot, but you are there to meet the needs of others. You are there to serve others. You are there to give. You are there to sacrifice. In Mark chapter 9, uh, there's a story about Jesus traveling with his disciples. Jesus is traveling with them, and the disciples are back there having a discussion among themselves. And the discussion isn't getting really loud. And you'll understand why here in a minute. But, but you know, they're kind of discussing among themselves, thinking that Jesus isn't hearing them, which is kind of funny. All this time they've spent with Jesus, you think they'd figured out he's God? Duh. He knows everything. He hears everything. He sees everything. Even when you're trying to be quiet and be hushed. But in Mark chapter 9, verse 33 through 35, and they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. In other words, they're busted and they know it. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. The disciples were having their own little tantrum. Jesus, you're spending too much time with Peter, Paul. You're spending too much time with James. You're spending too much time with Nathaniel. Why aren't you spending time with me? Well, I'm going to be the greatest, right? James and John. They were such men that they asked their mommy to ask Jesus if they could be first, right? Remember that? Their mom came to Jesus and said, can my son sit on your right and left? That's what every man does is have his mommy ask when he doesn't want to ask. But they're arguing over who would be first. Do you realize that the word servant occurs 57 times in the New Testament? And the word serve 58 times. You know, they teach us in speech and communication class, that when someone repeats something or you hear a phrase repeated over and over again, it's probably a point of emphasis. Jesus, in Mark 9, 35, says we are to serve all. Paul picks up on this theme as well in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 7. He makes a statement about service. In the NIV, it says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Notice the ESV, the English Standard Version, the version I like to read a lot out of. It says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Notice how the translators of different versions stay true to the original Greek, the original meaning of the author, but they're putting different words in that place of the word servant. But the idea is the same as a minister is we are to serve the people that God has given us to minister to, to look over. As a minister of the gospel, okay, as a minister of the gospel, we are to serve the gospel. Well, how do I serve the gospel? The gospel is is the word that Jesus came, died on a cross sacrificially, rose victoriously, that I don't have to die and go to hell. How do I serve the gospel? You serve the gospel by preaching the gospel. Well, I don't want to be preachy, Pastor. That's your job. Well, share the gospel. Share your testimony. And, and, and here's a novel idea. Don't just take a track and roll it up in the toilet paper at the gas station. I know some of you are like, man, I never thought of that. Thanks, Pastor. I can mark that off my list. 
actually share it with your lives. Serve people. Get involved in our community. Do what the church is supposed to have been doing for years that we allow the government to do now. Our can drive, our, our, our clothing drive for these, for these underwear and these socks, these are needs in our community that the poor and those that are less fortunate need our help. And Jesus expects us as the church to embody serving and living in our communities. So you say you're a Christ follower. You say you're a Christian. What you doing? There's our catchphrase. What you doing about it? You say you're a member of the church. You say, yes, that's my church. I'm active. Well, what are you doing? How is your serve? What's that old line? The proof is in the pudding. Which we're probably going to have pudding over there after, after church. But the proof is in what is truly there. A survey of churches that were innerly focused yielded some very telling results. By the way, I messed this up. Real quick service announcement in the middle of the message. Uh, the books are back there. They're $5. And the other books you see up there are the books we're going to study Sunday night. Uh, they were thirteen ninety or something like that. If you want one, we don't want to keep anyone from getting them. Pick one up. Just put an extra $5 or an extra $13 in the offering plate. You don't need to mark it. Just take care of it that way, all right? Service announcement now. If you, if you read your book, if you read that book or whatever, Tom brings out 10 things that he saw in inwardly focused churches. Okay, when he looked at them as a church consultant, he said these things, these top 10 things were prevalent. We're going to look at them. Worship wars. Worship wars were involved in the inwardly focused church. Why would there be worship, worship wars? Well, because I like my music. I do. And I think all of you should like my music the same way I like my music. Because in my world, this music is king. This music is boss. All right? The good news for you guys, if I am calling the musical shots, is I have a wide range of musical likes. I, except for punk rock and that kind of stuff. That's not my big gig. But I like a wide range of music, from classical to rap to all sorts of stuff. So for me, it's not that bad. But in our churches... We get hung up on, well, is it in a hymnal? Or is it a praise chorus? Why are they singing that 500 times? Can't they sing it and move on? You, you, you know I'm saying the truth because you said it. You just wouldn't say it out loud up front. And again, that's why I get paid the big bucks is, is I get to be honest in front of everybody. Worship wars. If you're inwardly focused, if church is about you, you're going to make sure that when you go to a church that they sing your songs. That the guy on stage has, you know, a nice big dark, do you have a dark glasses? Yeah, you know, those nice glasses on and, and cute hair and, you know, he's trendy and, and, and has a nice guitar with him. All those other things. Where's his, his, his Converse, you know, tennis shoes? Whatever the trend is in worship music, you want that to be in your church. Some of you want the other way. Why do we have to have guitar? Why do we have to have drums? If the piano was good enough for Moses, it's good enough for me. All right? There's both ends of the spectrum, guys. But why do we come to church? Is it about your music? Or is it truly about praising God? Prolonged minutia meetings. I hate long meetings. I, I try and set the time ahead of schedule and tell you we're going to try and keep to it. And it's my job if I'm the head of the meeting or wh whoever's heading up the meeting in our church to try and stick to that schedule the best you can. Why? Why? Because I understand your life is busy. And when you have minutia meetings, you know what you're really doing? You're talking about the issue 900 different ways because no one wants to make a decision because a decision's going to upset someone. So we keep talking about it because I really don't want to make the call because someone will be upset. And if someone gets upset, then I can't bear it if they're upset with me. So minutia in meetings are inwardly focusing churches. There's always discussion about what they want, so the meetings drag out. Facility focus. Facility focus. Our buildings have to be pristine. Everything has to be kept up. Um, you can spend a lot of money maintaining and building new buildings. But if you don't invest money in evangelism and service, you're not going to fill those buildings. So facilities are noticed of an inwardly focused church. Program driven. You've got to have the programs. I, I know because I talked to my deacons and some of you before we ever canceled Sunday school for the summer. 
boy, we just don't do that, Pastor. We've had Sunday school ever since Moses in this church. It's right there in the morning. You're right. I don't attend, but I don't know if I'm comfortable with the church not having Sunday school because there's one Sunday I may decide to attend. I know that was a difficult decision for us, but we had a purpose in doing it. We weren't just canceling Sunday school to cancel it. We were trying to work with our program, give our teachers a break, and get ready for a big push this fall. And I believe God has honored that. Those that have met for prayer, and this month as we've talked about what a church is together as a whole church, it's a different kind of Sunday school. And different can open our eyes to what we had and what can be as well. But just doing a program, because we've always done it, you can become slaves to that program, and that program becomes more important than the mission of the church. Inwardly focused budget. If you look at the church's budget and more money is spent on buildings and on salaries and on maintenance than outreach and missions, the church is inwardly focused. Number six, inordinate demands of pastoral care. Well, I went in for an eye exam and the doctor had to dilate my eyes and I can't believe Pastor Scott wasn't there to pray over my dilated eyes. I know that it is a big deal to some people, others it's not. You know, people who believe the church is there for them, they believe the pastor and the deacon should be at their beck and call. And and I do answer my phone all the time. I am guilty of that. You can ask my wife. Even if I put it on vibrate, I'll hear it, and I check it. Uh, That's just the way God wired me. Um, I try and break the cycle, and I'll be good at short periods of time. Uh, But I do want to be there to serve you. Our deacons do want to be there to serve you. But over depending on us, is a sign of an inwardly focused church. Um, In that motion would be, we pay your salary. We expect you to do this. We already covered that in our first message. But but speaking like that. Um, Number seven, attitudes of entitlement. Attitudes of entitlement. You know, I give, I expect it to be this way. You know, I would like blue flowers out front. And since I give regularly to the church... My wishes, my wants ought to be ought to be catered to. I, I think that, you know, whatever it is, I think the new church bucks should be bright yellow. I mean, like bright yellow so everyone can see us coming. Whatever it is, you think that things ought to be given to you because you're a church member. I deserve to be able to go through the line first. You know, I deserve to sit in my favorite pew at church. I deserve this. I deserve that. Entitlement starts settling in in a church. Eight, greater concern about change than the gospel. If your church, if our church, if any church is arguing more about changes in programs or changing to the appearance of the outside, then we are worried about people coming to Jesus Christ. We have an inwardly focused church. Number nine, anger and hostility. When people aren't getting along, we talked about forgiveness last week. When there's unforgiveness that's prevalent. That is a sign of an inwardly focused church. And then number 10, the big one, evangelistic apathy. Evangelistic apathy. This is a hard one. Um, a lot of churches say, oh, we've been baptizing a bunch, of, a bunch of people. And this time of year, a lot of churches are baptizing a lot of kids. God has allowed us to see kids come to know Jesus at, at church camp, at children's camp, and we baptize those kids. But when was the last time that we shared Christ with a peer, with an adult? When we saw someone, that when we baptized someone who wasn't a member or didn't grow up in this church. That's evangelism. I know that doesn't sound popular. That doesn't sound nice even as I say these words to you. But the truth is if we're not sharing our faith. If we're not seeing our baptistry used every week. That evangelism fervor is probably pretty dim in our church. That's an inwardly focused church. So what's the solution? What's the solution to get things off of me and get things onto someone else? Well, Philippians chapter 2, Jesus himself is our solution. Jesus' example is the way any church gets out of that, that, that uh, rut. Ephesians, I mean, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. There's that word again. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
So what did Jesus do? Well, there's four things in this little passage that Jesus did. He did not use his equality as something to bring him gain or to be used for his advantage. Even though he was God, even though when he was in the desert and he could have provided food, even a little snack, he said, I am not going to play the God card. I am not going to play the I've been a member here longer than anyone else card. I'm not going to play I cleaned up the church last week card. I'm not going to play I've given more hours than Richard has card. I'm not going to look for equality. I am going to not take advantage of my status. The second thing Jesus did, he emptied himself by taking on the position of a slave or a servant. He took not the highest position, he took the lowest position. And of course we see that when they go to the upper room and no one washes off his feet and Jesus takes the towel noticing that this normal, common courtesy had not been done and he does the unthinkable and washes the disciples' feet. He took on the form of a servant, of a slave. Three, (coughs) excuse me, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. That goes back to serving. He served all. He was patient when the disciples, when they didn't get it the first 450 times, he kept explaining himself. He kept telling them, hey, you've got to do this. You're missing the point. You're missing this. He humbled himself. And fourthly, what Jesus did in this passage is he became obedient. He became obedient. He did whatever God wanted him to do even to the worst death thinkable, the death on the cross. The death that was, that was separated for those that were the worst of the worst. Jesus said, God, if you want me to go there, I'm going there. Jesus is our example of how not to make church about us. We set aside our position. We, we humbly serve and we obey. I love these, this passage so much. When uh, we were involved in our church plant, uh, we made this passage our key verses for our church. And, And in our emblem, we had humbly serve and obey as the three words to remember how we're to conduct church. If we're going to be a church that represents Jesus, we need to live and act like Jesus. He set aside his position. He emptied himself. He became humbly like a servant. And he obeyed whatever God had for him to do. There's a video I'm going to show you now that's a different illustration. I've heard this story told often in different forms. Even the founder of the Salvation Army has a, has a story that's similar to this. But maybe this video will bring to mind or, or bring to thought some of the applications of a church that doesn't put this stuff into play.
victims of a shipwreck be cleaned up before coming inside. The outsiders made the life-saving station extremely dirty. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities because they felt that they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. But a small number of members insisted on life-saving as their primary mission and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. After all, the dissenting group's members were voted for that and told that if they wanted to save lives, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, however, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old station. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was found. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that eastern seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most of the passengers do not. You can see the pattern woven throughout this illustration. If, if you've been around church very long, you've seen it. You've seen churches grow and you've seen them do great things. And then all of a sudden they start shifting inwardly. And it's about the building, how it looks. It's about we can't get things dirty. If the kids run in church and they trip or they left a mess. And we've got we've to clamp down on those kids. We've got to stop this. We've got to stop that. And we're no longer a life-saving station. We're a club. Did you catch the part where they paid people to go out and save lives because they weren't willing to do it anymore? Isn't that what we do as churches? We pay missionaries. We hire people to come in and do our VBS or something because we're unwilling to do the work that we were called to do as a life-saving station. And then you get people that catch fire again. A, a, a boat goes down and they save lives and they want to continue to save lives and they feel the pressure of the rest of the club members to not be able to do that. And so they say, I've had enough and they leave the club and they go start another, another life-saving station. And if they're not cape, careful, the cycle will repeat itself. Tom has a statement like he always does. I am a church member. I will not let my church be about my preferences and desires. That is self-serving. I am a church member in this church to serve others and to serve Christ. My Savior went to the cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matters that aren't my preferences or style. It's about life-saving, people. We come to church not to have our needs met exclusively we talked about that this morning in church we need to come to church to be encouraged to be instructed to encourage others to instruct others why because we have a mission to do to go out and save lives that's what the church is here for and if we're not doing our job then the question has to be is that life-saving emblem over top of our building just a slogan should we take it down and put up Keys Baptist Club? I am a church member. I will not let my church be about my preferences, my desires. My Savior went to the cross for me. I can deal with any inconveniences and matters that aren't my preferences or style. I hope all of us can say that. That our goal, that our hearts cry is to seek after Christ with our whole heart and see people's lives changed. To save lives. Yep, the building may be dirty. Some things may fall apart from now again. But that's because we need to keep spending money, investing in our community, reaching out to people's lives. This Tuesday, or last Tuesday, our church, Keys Baptist Church, invested roughly about $450 to serve the teachers and the staff at our at our schools and it was an amazing time that's your money that's your offering that's your church building getting dirty getting used serving our community we'll have other chances coming up i hope you're willing and able 
to set aside more of your time to help us as a church as we reach and serve our community. Let's bow for a closing word of prayer. Father, this morning, as we've looked at your word, the idea in in this chapter, chapter 3, about church not being about our preferences. And if we're honest, it never starts that way because that would be selfish of us to say that we want it this way, it has to be this, that, that God only works through this. You know, I believe we have good intentions, but when we don't keep ourselves accountable, if we don't keep balancing ourselves and bouncing our ideas off of your word first, we can get off track and we can make other things a priority that you clearly don't have as a priority for us. May we seek your kingdom here on earth as you change us and work through us. In your name we pray, amen.